a message right now. And if you don't want your face in the recording, you can turn off your camera. If you don't want your name, you can also change your name. And uh, that's it. Now I really pass the microphone to Claudia. Thank you very much, Betty. Um, hello and welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today for the webinar Cost for Cloud and its services for the citizen science community. We'll start with a round of introduction um, here with our speakers, and it's a pleasure to have them with us today. First, we have Sonia. Sonia works at the Marine Sciences Institute, ICM Physic, and she's part of the Cost for Cloud coordination team and head of communication and citizen engagement in Cost for Cloud. We also have Norbert Schmidt. Norbert is the founder and owner of TDQ Pocket Science. This is also a Cost for Cloud partner. And Norbert leads the development of the service Mobius, from which you will be hearing more today. We have Frederick Forley Marie. Frederick is co director and co founder of DNACON, also Cost for Cloud partner. And Frederick co leads the development of two of the services we're developing in the project FastCAD Cloud and FastCAD Edge. And last but not least, we have Chris Valentine. Chris works at the Open University, also Cost for Cloud partner. He works on citizen science projects, including the Citizen Observatory iSpot and its integration with FastCAD Cloud, which he will be talking about today. Then this is me. This uh, I'll be the webinar moderator of today. I work at the European Citizen Science Association, EXA, as a project officer for both the projects Cost for Cloud and Acting. And within Acting, I support the communication efforts and the stakeholder engagement. And here you have some of the um, Cost for Cloud social media accounts. Before moving on to the agenda, we would um, I'd like to invite you to, to follow Cost for Cloud on social media and visit our website. We are quite active on our socials and website where we post um, quite some um, updates on the project and you'll find um, a lot of information there. Also, before moving on to the agenda, we would like to invite you to become part of our community. The Cost for Cloud community has taken part in the um, co-design of the services in the project. These services are currently being tested. So you are welcome to join the community if you'd like to get informed um, about upcoming opportunities to participate in that. You can um, scan the QR codes shown on the screen or easily find how to join the community on the project website or through the link that I'll post in the chat in a second. There it is. And here's our agenda for today. The webinar will have four different parts. First, um, Sonia will briefly introduce you to the Cost for Cloud project. This will be followed by uh, the presentations of the services. Norbert will be presenting Mobius and Frederick will present FastCAD Cloud. Chris presentations will then be on the integration of the Citizen Observatory iSpot and the service FastCAD Cloud. And then we will move on to the Q&A. Please write all your questions in the chat also during the presentations and we will address them at the end. This will be the official end of the webinar and we'll stop the recording, which will be available on the EXA YouTube channel soon. And after that, the, four part, the fourth part of the webinar today, um, we will leave the Zoom room open for everyone that um, have more comments or more questions to the speakers for an informal open discussion and we'll be, we'll be wrapping up at 12.30 um, yeah, Berlin time. And with this, I would like to give the word um, to Sonia. And Sonia, please go ahead. Thanks, Claudia. One second, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. So hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming today. I'm going to explain a little bit what is a castle cloud and how will it improve uh, citizen science, or at least how we <laughs> want to improve citizen science. So as uh, Claudia said, I'm Sonia Liña, and I'm part of the of the coordination team of Cost for Cloud, jointly with uh, Jauma, that is a coordinator, and Karen. And well, 
we are, I'm going to explain already a bit what are a citizen observatory, which, which are the cost for cloud services, uh, what are the benefits for the citizen science community. And again, <laughs> I'm going to uh, explain you how to be part of the cost for cloud community as, as Claudia said. So one of the biggest challenges of citizen science is the quality of the data and also maintaining the citizen observatories that are used to collect this data. And Cosmo Cloud is addressing these challenges. We want to develop, or we want not, we are developing a series of technological services to improve uh, the citizen science platforms that we know also as citizen observatories. And we are helping them to boost the quantity and the quality of observation. And finally, we want them to, to we want to ensure their, their long-term viability. So how we are going to do this and how we are, we have been working on this. Uh, first, I want to tell you that we are kind of a bridge between citizen science and the European Science Cloud, the EUC. Uh, the European Open Science Cloud, it's a virtual space. It's, it's, um, it's aimed at the European scientific community. So anyone interested in creating or improving the citizen observatory can use the, can use the the, the open uh, the European Open Science Cloud uh, services and <coughs> I'm sorry, etc. So our cutting edge services uh, will be on the European Science Cloud, so anyone can can use it. Okay. Again, uh, citizen science is this kind of a bridge between science and society. Uh, Citizens contribute to science, they give us new perspectives, they help us to solve societal change, they help us to, um, well, we, we help them to empower, to empower them, but we have now a lot of problems with these uh, technological resources, with these citizen observatories, and our solution, the Cost for Cloud is bringing this solution, it, this is this uh, cutting edge services. Uh, these services, as I said, will be available on the European Open Science Cloud. But I think that the most important thing is that we are not thinking these services and developing these services all alone. We are co-designing and prototyping and testing these services with communities. We are using end users. We are asking uh, feedback. Uh, we are really trying to create something that is useful for the users and for the citizen science community. So we are, have developed this co-design methodology. This, the Cost for Cloud uh, project used the co-design methodology for prototyping the services from the bottom up, as I said. We use the, the quadruple helix approach and we allow the customization of in all the required phases. Our main goal is to align mutual interest to tackle the technological challenge of citizen science. And for do that, uh, we are organizing face-to-face -face workshops, online interactions, and we are going to test the services among all the end users involved. So as a result of this co-design methodology, in Cost for Cloud, we will improve all the functional specifications of the services. Later on, I'm going to explain which services uh, have been uh, co-designed, which services are still a work in progress, and which services have been started the testing, etc. But now I just want to show you this, um, this infographics. You can see here, more or less, this co-design methodology used in Cost for Cloud. Uh, in the website, you have a lot of more information. So since we don't have a lot of time today, I invite you to check the website. And also, um, I want to tell you that at the end of the project, we will have this methodology also as a service. So we'll, we will have co-design as a services. So anyone will be able to use this methodology to improve or to develop new citizen science uh, services. Well, and how we are co-designing because we, we want to co-design, we're co-designing these services, but we cannot do it alone. So uh, Cost of Cloud relies on the participation of this network of citizen observatories and do it yourself initiatives. We have here, you can see other collect, we have iSpec, we have Canario, iSpot, etc. So we are trying to uh, connect these services 
in these uh, citizen observatories and do-it-yourself initiatives, because these platforms are the responsible for the testings of the, of the services. We are now in the phase of developing and almost finalizing, finalizing the developing of all the services, and we are starting now the, the testing, and we will do it through this, um, through this uh, network of citizen science observatories. So, okay, <laughs> let's talk about the, the services, is that's why we are here now. Uh, as I said, we have a lot of uh, information in our website, so I'm not going to explain all the service again, uh, because you have a lot, a lot, a lot of information in our Cost for Cloud services. But I just want to tell you that these are our main priorities. Uh, Cost for Cloud services will be is, uh, are co-designed with the stakeholders. We are using a standard based data models. We want to create a modular software ecosystems around citizen science knowledge. And our, uh, our services are focusing on the final user and the potential impact of the citizen science. And this will be done, uh, what well, has been uh, done by developing artificial intelligence, data quality and reputation assessment services. Also with personalizing notification systems and services focused on data notification and user experience. And finally, we are integrating uh, data from biodiversity and environmental quality, and we are developing a knowledge transfer and linguistic tools. So we are doing a lot of things uh, surrounding these uh, services. And I invite you to check our website. You can find there uh, infographics about the services, uh, descriptions, uh, even videos, etc. So check the website and you will have more information about our services. And just a quick overview on how, uh, which point we are now here in Cost for Cloud. As you can see, we have already five services in the EOC, EOC marketplace. And we are working on integrating uh, all the like seven, eight, sorry, eight uh, more services in the, in, the, in the EOC. And if you check our website, you will see that uh, Cost for Bio, Movies, Planet, API, Authentics, and FastCut Cloud uh, are already also in GitHub repository. So you have all the information. If it's not in GitHub, it's another <laughs> kind of repository, but you can check all the information there. We have uh, setting up all the privacy information and we have um, started the testing of the Mekoda services. Even that these services is not still in the EOS catalog, we are testing them and in real case scenario with end users. And what are we what are we are going to do now? Since uh, the development and the co-design process is ending, we are starting the testing process. So now that we have all these services developed, we want to check that they are really useful and that they are they can be used in real case scenario. So we have been doing BioBliss, hackathons, workshops, et cetera, to test uh, these services. And I really invite you to join our Cost for Cloud community because we are going to start sending you a lot of information about the next workshops, hackathons, uh, et cetera, and events to test the services. You can even tell us, okay, I'm interested just in this and this and this uh, service, and uh, we will send you also information uh, regarding this the services that you're interested in. But uh, not everything is about the services in Cost for Cloud. All our work is, is um, aimed <laughs> to develop these services, but it's not just about the technological development, uh, surrounding all these services in order to co-design them and to test them, etc. We have created an online citizen science course. Uh, we are doing these demonstration events. We have developed this co-design methodology, etc. So again, <laughs> I, I, I invite you to join our community uh, and you will be able to participate in all these kind of courses, events, etc. and help us to, to be part of this change and to boost uh, citizen science technologies. Uh, here you have that you can join us uh, in the co-design part, in the panels, just to advise, to give us some advice or in the testing phase. So when you go to the formulary to that uh, Claudia sent you in the chat, you can choose whether 
one of these communities you want to join in and you will be more than welcome in the in the project and that's it thank you okay thank you very much sonia and um norbert you want to go ahead and present mobius sure thank you very much thanks for the invitation This is the Mobis server we are working on. It's the abbreviation of the Mobile Observation Integration Service. A lot of words, but uh, we'll try to explain you clearly about the benefits of this service, which is mostly ready. That's the good news. Um, we we'll always have problems with uh, a lot of apps, citizen science apps, initiatives. Each app you have to sign on, for example. So leave your username, password, email. Um, and we have the idea to integrate, offer a platform for integration of uh, to solve this problem and do even more, not only log in, but do multiple observations of different kinds in one very simple app. And here you can see the screen. For example, you can take a sky measurement using iSpecs, which is a spectrometer for smartphones, still on the telephone, it's also almost ready. It also supports the external sensor Canario. Uh, for those not familiar with Canario, it's a Amazon sensor of PM 2.5 sensor, and it's all open source. We managed to make a connection to that. And probably you're familiar with PlantNet, uh, reported by their diversity observation. And there are more sensors coming into the mobile uh, Mobis platform and more citizen observatories. So that's that's the app, that's the front end, how we call that. And what we deliver is not only an app, because we deliver a framework of source code. So every developer of citizen observatories can grab the code and implement their own observatory within this framework. So that's that's the biggest advantage. So Norbert, we have a problem with your sound. Um, it's okay. coming and going. Maybe, I don't know if you can speak closer to the mic, but sometimes it works. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. Does this, is this better? Okay. Yes, much better. Sorry for this. Um, okay, we'll resume. Um, we developed an app. Uh, it, it's, it's more like a showcase app. What we develop is uh, software for developers to create their own citizen observatory uh, applications. And um, the, the user is uh, for the user, it's possible to report all kinds of observations like uh, air quality, water quality, and even biodiversity all in one app with one single login and all is made open source and complies to open standards and GDPR. Uh, for example, we have the backend, which is really a service as we call it. The backend uh, is a quick, uh, a fairly quick server residing on the uh, EU uh, European grid interface uh, service uh, and it allows storage of all kinds of data, push notifications, authentication and all kinds of APIs like the Sensor Things API from uh, OGC. So uh, we really aim to make this open and quick and good as possible. And you can see in this list that there's already a lot of data coming in from smartphones and sensors, and it, it's working quite well for almost a year now. And there we are, some practical examples of how this works. Uh, on the top left, there's an old school device. Uh, it's, it's brilliant to do with kids too, um, to, to determine the water color. 
enterability, for example, and you can enter it into our app. On the left, you can see a Canario device, uh, which I called earlier. That's another Cost for Cloud partner, uh, an observatory. We managed to integrate that with Mobis, and now uh, the users uh, are testing the interface for uh, connectivity. They're walking, they're, they're doing their uh, walks and bike sessions with uh, the Mobis app. And we even hooked on other apps, which are not formally part of Cost for Cloud, but because it works so well, we uh, added other light pollution apps, for example, citizen science apps, which are quite popular. They, we connected them to Mobis too. So that's that's it's a good performer. It works well, and uh, we aim to make it very user friendly. And therefore, we uh, since almost a year we are uh, the, the service is available for uh, on the european open science clouds cloud and we aim to further develop this service uh, together with another uh, horizon project called nianias to implement more services like machine learning and artificial intelligence on the back end so for example uh, if we get a spectrum from a spectrometer it is able to automatically determine the color of water, for example. So that's quite promising. And we uh, continue working on both the software for the front end and, and the back end service. And this is an example of an interface. I will not go into much detail with this because it's quite technical, but uh, we care, one of the missions is to uh, create good interoperability with uh, other projects within Cost for Cloud, but also uh, external, of course. And you can see that uh, this is an example of the Sensor Things API from the uh, Open Geo uh, Spatial Consortium. And uh, that works. It's available for every service and every observatory which joins um, the Mobis initiative. So. For now, the more technical part may be a bit boring, but it's very uh, nice to put Mobis into the practice and into testing. And my colleague, Joop, uh, got out for a walk. And maybe, Claudia, you can spin the video so it has sound. I'll do that. I have to share my screen. If you can stop sharing yours, I'll go ahead with mine. Thank you. Okay, please let me know if you cannot hear the sound. Tumpa National Reserve near Brasov, the city center, and I am doing my measurements for cost per cloud with the Canario to measure the air quality in this area. And you can see there's a beautiful nature here. They are having a street rally race. So what would this do with the air quality of the city? Maybe we can find out. We are here at Tumpa, and this is the peak.
I'm going back into the city. You can hear the traffic. Let's see what happens. Romania is famous for its biodiversity. As one of the last places in Europe where large virgin forests have remained untouched, the Carpathians are known to house a variety of flora and fauna. In some places you can find more than 100 unique species of plants within one square meter. On the Piata Cailui Ridge you can find a species that can be found nowhere else in the world. During this trip we will go up on the mountain and register lichens at high altitude. Okay, that was um, the video on Morris. Um, thank you very much, Norbert, for the presentation. If you, if you have any questions um, for Sonia or Norbert, don't forget to post them in the chat and we will address them later during the Q&A. And now I'd like to give the word to Frederick to introduce us to FastCAD Cloud. Frederick, we don't hear you yet. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I shared the screen first and then I couldn't get to Zoom interface sorry so uh, hi i'm frederick uh, i'm gonna present fastcat cloud with fastcat stands for the flexible ai system for camera traps and this is uh, a version uh, that runs on the cloud we also have a current version uh, called edge fastcat edge which i will say a little bit about not the focus today which is a camera trap system itself that you can build and we tell you how to do that 
So uh, let me uh, reshare the screen again. Just a second. Okay, so <clears throat> you should see my screen now. And uh, yes. first slide, let me jump to the next one. So the aims of uh, our project is, are to make, first to make biodiversity monitoring easy uh, and also efficient and quick. Uh, we focus on animals. We've heard of PlantNet within the Cost for Cloud Consortium, which focuses mainly on, on plants. Uh, so we are focusing on animals uh, on land. Uh, uh, there, there could be also room for uh, animals uh, in water, for example, but we focus on animals on land and we use, we integrate uh, state-of-the-art AI techniques. I will say a little more about that soon. Again, uh, the, uh, the, the, the sort of goal is to deal with imagery produced by camera traps. I'm assuming everybody is familiar with the concept of camera trap, essentially, a camera system you put in the wild, you leave there, it captures images, often based on detecting movement first. It can produce, uh, especially if it's based mainly on movement, it can produce a lot of empty images or images, for example, where there's only plants rather than animals. As an example here, we have one of the main uh, used uh, data set in, in research and development in this space, the snapshot Serengeti camera traps that is said from uh, Africa, where uh, about uh, more than two thirds of, of the images available are, are empty of animals. So this is a typical uh, main problem we, we, we solve or we want to solve. Uh, the other main aspect uh, through AI technology is that we try to bring in human expert uh, uh, knowledge to help with the identification of the species themselves. So essentially we want to make potentially anybody interested become a contributor to biodiversity monitoring. We offer two, currently two main uh, software product uh, on the, that run on the cloud. One is a web application and I will I'll show you some examples soon, uh, where essentially you can go on the web, on, the, on our uh, web system, and you can upload some images, and then you'll get some results uh, provided by the AI technology. Um, we also offer an API, so essentially a piece of software that with uh, tutorials, documentation, so that you can integrate our technology within your own system. And uh, there will be a a presentation by Chris Valentine from iSpot Open University following this one, which will uh, talk a lot more about that aspect. So I won't go into details. We also uh, will provide, so this is in development, the possibility to use the software directly to send observations. So you upload images, the system gives you high confidence, um, identification of species and, and bounding boxes around the animals in the images. And these could be sent directly to citizens observatories. Uh, so another way to interact and, and submit uh, data. Uh, finally, uh, we also um, the, in, in development, uh, having a smooth transition between the, our own smart camera trap system called FastCat Edge, so that it can feed directly its results into FastCat Cloud. Uh, briefly, FastCat Edge, uh, this would be a different presentation to go into the details, but this is what it looks like. It's based on an RPI uh, system, so very cheap, uh, affordable uh, system, very small, uh, small scale, a few centimeters um, in, in size. Uh, the camera is often the, the biggest part of your system, and this can then be put in a box or, or, or sort of container. Uh, and we provide, again, documentation on how to put this all together. Um, the other thing to say here is we also offer the possibility to add environmental sensors uh, that we've developed and uh, can be ordered from us. So moving on, uh, more details on the AI technology itself. 
uh, it's based mainly on uh, so-called convolution uh, neural networks. Uh, over the recent years, uh, the technology keeps improving. And so we integrate the best systems that are around. We test them for you. Uh, a lot of the computation uh, takes place when we train. So once we have a particular type of a neural network selected, uh, we then need to train it with uh, lots and lots of images. We're talking here uh, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of images. Uh, so this, this is part of the, the work that takes place at Dean Icon in the background. And typically, just to give you a feeling, if you're not familiar, uh, such training uh, on uh, advanced computing uh, machines still takes days, if not uh, weeks, sometimes, depending on the size of the data set. Uh, more recently, so you'll see when you go to our, to our web uh, app website that we offer different models and we will keep uh, augmenting the set of models uh, so basically different types of neural networks uh, solutions. And more recently, we offer in particular uh, a version of faster RCNN and of the very recently uh, produced YOLOR uh, architecture. Uh, we train on different types of data sets. More recently, we use uh, the GBIF data set, which is uh, probably the largest data set available. Uh, in the open space. Uh, and uh, as you go on our website, you'll see that we offer three models at the moment. One has been trained on data sets from images of animals in, in the California uh, region and two others in across the UK and mammals across the UK. Uh, and again, this is just the beginning. We will have, we will introduce more and more of such uh, regional based models. To give uh, those who are more familiar with the uh, accuracy of these systems, so currently at the bottom here, you have some uh, figures, uh, the mean average precision. So over all images tested uh, is re uh, reaches between 0.75 to 0.77, depending on the uh, neural network used. Uh, currently, we offer species ident identifications for up to 22 main species found in the UK, uh, again, mammals. Uh, we are in the process of augmenting this to 36. Uh, and on the right side here, you see uh, so just the, the, to give you a feel for the number of um, specimens or items we have per species uh, when training. So we're in the thousands. Uh, quickly, I will run through a short video, probably not show you all of it, just because time is running out. So let me bring that up. Uh, this video is on YouTube, so you can consult it later. And basically, it walks you through the main steps of using our API. So this is the, the case where uh, from the website, you access the um, sorry, uh, no, this is the web uh, interface rather. And the API is also available from that same uh, web uh, interface. Uh, so here you have an example where you load your own images directly on the web. Simple example here, a set of six images. You submit uh, the images to the system. You, you see that you have a little bit of waiting time here and then you get uh, your results. So you have uh, two types of information. You have bounding boxes and you have a proposed uh, species identification with some confidence level. And these reflect uh, the, the sort of mean average precision metric uh, I mentioned before uh, that the systems uh, uses to, to sort of decide what is the likely identification. So yes, the, the, the video is a bit longer, gives you, uh, walks you through the API as well. I won't spend too much time on that uh, if you're interested, but just to show you that there, there is detailed documentation available. And again, uh, we will see an example of using this uh, piece of software uh, in the context of an integration into iSpot following my presentation. So let me 
stop the video for now and uh, go back to my presentation. So yes, here we are. So next step, so I'm, I'm reaching uh, my conclusion. Uh, what we will add in the coming uh, weeks and months, uh, we will augment, as I mentioned, the number of machine learning based models available. Uh, we are currently offering uh, two main regions as examples, as I mentioned, Californian uh, region and UK uh, region, and we will uh, keep augmenting these, these sets. And we are happy to talk to uh, uh, people, to you, uh, if you have a need for a particular region where there's good uh, data available. So data obviously is, is key here to be able to train the system and, and reach good accuracy. Uh, in terms of technology, we're currently offering only analysis uh, or results based on snapshots or so individual images. They can be a, a series of snapshots, so sort of a subset of a video, but we are also working on video processing. We currently have a, a solution that exists that can run directly on our camera trap itself. And we will introduce uh, such solutions on the cloud uh, system uh, shortly in, in the coming months. Uh, we mentioned, uh, it was mentioned that the service uh, will be part of EOSC. So this is uh, in, in, in process, uh, shortly should be available. Uh, and uh, again, next, you will hear about how FastCat Cloud can be run from a citizen observatory such as iSpot. There is uh, more information available if you're interested. This is my final slide. Don't worry about all the details here, but this is available from this link here, which is directly from the Cusp of Cloud project. So if you go there, you'll find information about FastCat Cloud uh, with other videos, other, other the details, uh, links uh, directly back to uh, the system. So let me uh, just end with uh, the main website, if you go to it, FastCat Cloud, called service.fastcatcloud.org. Uh, this is what it looks like, and you'll have demo API available, uh, more details, uh, documentation. And uh, that's it for now. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Frederick. And I would like to um, give the word to our last speaker today, Chris Valentine. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I'll just share my browser window. Right, so that's uh, set me up nicely to explain our integration with the FastCat Cloud service, which I'm using to help uh, with identifications um, uh, made to observations submitted to the iSpot Citizen Science project. This is the home page, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So I'm just going to jump to the list of UK uh, mammal observations and you can see just scrolling through these latest ones that the variety of images vary greatly uh, by the users. Some don't even include the animal that they're attempting to identify. Some are really small in the frame, even smaller, some not even alive. So you can imagine how difficult a process it is to uh, work out um, what you're looking at in the image. So what I've done is I've used the API uh, in a two-step process, firstly to submit an image to, to the system, and then I give the system 24 hours before I attempt to retrieve uh, the possible identifications. Um, so let me go into one of the observations just to give you an example. Um, the title of the observation is often not very useful at all, but this is quite an interesting observation in that the user has submitted a number of images. It's quite common to only submit a, sim a single image. Um, and I only submit what's called the primary image, which is the first image uh, uploaded. But you can see just looking through these, that it would be possible to submit more than one image from an observation and maybe concatenate the data together. So as I say, the system um, is two stage. Um, this is a screen grab of um, the first part of the process. Now, normally this will run completely 
transparently. It will run it as a scheduled service in the background. There won't be any output to the screen. Um, but I just wanted to show this as an example of the data that's being ex, uh, interchanged. At the top, you can see uh, the image that's being submitted. Um, you can see it's come back as JSON and it's given a, a couple of uh, unique strings identifiers that the system will then use uh, 24 hours later to pick up the observations. And you can also see here the, uh, the numerical ID of the observation inside iSpot. So I'm going to be really brave now. I'm going to run the second half of the script. Uh, so this will hopefully um, retrieve uh, some data from images submitted just a few days ago. Fortunately, it has worked. Um, now, the system does actually respond with um, possibilities or ratings or scores, as you can see the numbers here, of all of the species that are in the model. Um, as Frederick explained, there's currently 22 UK mammals recognised by the system, but it's currently being tra trained to expand that number to 36. And for each, uh, each possibility, it gives a, a numeric score. Um, and it gives the GBIF uh, key of the species that it thinks uh, the image represents. Now, at the moment, we don't represent this uh, score on screen because we think a number like that could be misleading to our users. But what we might do later is to convert these numbers into some textual representation. Um, so um, th this is why the, the number isn't shown. So that's given some uh, hopefully some uh, feedback on the submitted images. Now, normally when uh, human users use iSpot, they, they submit identifications. Now, this can be done by anyone, either the person submitting the observation or by any other users. And of course, you can agree with these uh, identifications or you can, if you think it's a different species, you can add um, an identification of, of your own. But so far, we've um, instead of actually making a formal identification, what we're doing is we're feeding um, Basket Cloud's data into a comment on on the observation. So here you can see a completed um, comment, and you get basically the four most likely identifications being displayed. So although the system does return. Um, more up to the maximum number of uh, models in the system. We're only showing the top four. And the links here are to our own entries in, in our own species dictionary. So this is provided as um, a sort of user support to the system. We don't, as I say, we don't formally make an identification, but we're providing here suggestions um, that the users can decide that they, um, they want to make use of. Um, I just want to check on the most recent ones because it might be that if I look at one of these examples, this one was only submitted recently. So this is an observation that has only a single image and it just happens to be a very good, uh, a very good photograph and therefore should be quite a easier to identify. Um, it's been identified by a user as a sicker deer, and four people have agreed with it. And here we are. This is this has just been added to the system. Now the model at the moment doesn't have sicker deer as one of its um, possible answers, but that I believe that is one of the extra mammal species that will be added shortly. So, if I'd run this um, later in the year when the modelling had been updated, we would probably see sicker deer as as the primary suggestion. Um, so I think that's probably as much as I want to explain at the moment, um, given that we're a little bit over time, um, I think I'll probably leave my presentation for now, if that's okay. Yes, that's fine, Chris. Thank you very much for your input and also the inputs and presentations from all the other speakers. And now we'll move to the Q&A part of our web webinar today. We have some questions in the chat uh, and there's uh, have been some conversations going on, which is great. 
Um, so some questions have been addressed already. And since the webinar is being recorded and some people might um, watch the recording afterwards, I'd like to read out loud some of the questions and answers so that um, we keep them um, somewhere. Um, so Raina Brown uh, asked, is there difference uh, is there a difference between the ion water project and yours, or cost for cloud? I mean, from the measurement point of view, measuring water, secai disk, measuring water color, and so on. And Norbert has answered that um, we provide some of this, um, provides a software framework for recording observations, um, such as secai or FU. And above that, we provide a service, iSpecs, to provide reflectance spectroscopy to detect chlorophyll, for example. So one is able to do a complete scan. But the main goal is to provide software or service for other developers, researchers to build on. So now I'd like to give our speakers the opportunity to add to that if they wish to. But if, if not, I'll move to uh, a couple of the other answered questions before we, we can address the ones that have remained um, unanswered so far. So another of the um, answered questions was uh, well, a question from Israel Pierre. Does FASCAT identify butterflies? Um, Stefan and Clara have answered FASCAT Cloud does not recognize butterflies yet. And um, FASCAT Cloud currently only has models for UK mammals and some US animals, but they are working on models for UK birds, UK birds and so on as well. And I think the last from the answered Questions comes from um, Hannah Stockwell, who asked, who manages the data and how can, how do you address this with ethics, for example, multiple uses of citizens data. And Norbert has answered here that we are not storing or maintaining data for cost for cloud. Um, we deliver framework software for developers and a backend database that other observations or institutions can adopt, but with the authentic service Mobis complies with, with GDPR. So, so far on that, before we move on to other questions, Chris, Norbert, Frederick, would you like to add to any of this? Uh, so maybe about the last point, uh, sorry, let me bring the camera. Uh, yes, uh, you know, this is obviously a, a difficult topic. Uh, there are many potential issues. So for example, in our case, dealing with animals, uh, we, at the moment, remove humans. So if the system thinks there is a human in the image, then uh, the, the image itself is, is not uh, used anymore. Potentially, in the, we could uh, be a bit more sophisticated and remove uh, the box or the area where humans are. Uh, this is certainly feasible. Uh, but there are lots of issues around uh, that, uh, that topic of humans. Uh, some users might actually need to uh, detect humans uh, in the presence of animals. Uh, so this, you would have them to adapt uh, the technology to the particular need, and that's something we can do. Um, it was mentioned by Norbert, uh, GDPR compliancy. So that's obviously, uh, we all follow uh, those uh, requirements. Uh, and uh, we don't uh, also on the DNICon side and FASCAT uh, services, currently we don't host uh, data, the uh, raw data ourselves, we don't keep it on our servers. So we sort of avoid such uh, issues. But we understand that some users uh, may want uh, a service which would combine um, preserving their data together with all the ad additional information. So this is something, again, that can be developed for particular uh, needs, particular uh, partners. Um, yeah, so that's just a few more details. Hope it's uh, enough. Thank you. Great, thank you for adding to that. Since I had you on the spot just now, uh, there's a question directly for FASCAT from Andrea Swazzi, who asks if um, FASCAT also works on video or just on photos. I think you've covered oh, it. Yeah, so uh, thank you for, yeah, thank you. So that's a big, uh, another big topic. Uh, 
if we were to look at Frederick, you're frozen. Can you hear me? No, no, it works. Yeah. Okay, so there's a problem with my internet. Hopefully, uh, I'll be there a few more minutes. So I was saying that uh, mo most of the R&D and the software that you find uh, currently is for uh, images, uh, so snapshots. Video, there is results, there, are, there is technology, but it's much less explored. Uh, and that's uh, an area we are keen to offer uh, good uh, services on that side on, on tr treating video because we understand that this is a need for a lot of people uh, and we have some early solution that run on our fastcat edge uh, service so if you go to the cost for cloud uh, website you also find a uh, some information about the fastcat edge which is the camera trap system itself uh, and there uh, we have also a recent uh, open, open access publication that just got published in uh, Ecological Informatics Journal from um, Elsevier. And this is, uh, I think, in the title, we specifically deal with uh, video processing. So we offer some uh, new solutions there. Uh, but th this is an area which is in in current development, and you'll see a lot more offer in, in, in the coming months and years, and we will offer also more solutions. Currently not available on FastCat Cloud, but again, some solutions available on FastCat Edge on the camera trap system itself. Uh, we plan to have video solutions uh, by the end of the year available on cloud itself. That's promising to hear. Thank you very much. There are two questions and that I directed to the integration of iSpot and FastCut Cloud. Um, one of them is from Israel Peer, who asks if um, iSpot can, or he can use his own list of images on iSpot for identification. And the other is from Yaila Golombi. How is the AI implemented in iSpot different to the one used by iNaturalist? Uh, yeah, I think um, the academic lead on iSpot, Mike Dodd has partially answered that question. iSpot doesn't do identifications on its own. It, at the moment, all the identifications are done by users. <laughs> and if you wanted uh, images identified, you would have to upload them as observations um, and then wait for others to, to make identifications. Obviously, if, they're, if they were a UK mammal, they would be submitted now to FastCat Cloud for suggestions to be made in comments and um, I've also implemented the uh, PlantNet AI in the same way um, although it's not on the live server yet it will will be shortly so if you've got images that you want identified you need to sign up as a user and uh, submit them in uh, observation records um, the uh, AI um, I can't really answer the question about iNaturalist um, I'm, I'm only using that occasionally myself as a, as a as a human user, so I don't really know how uh, AI works in in iNaturalist. I'm afraid. Thank you, Chris. Um, so, from the audience, are there any more questions? Yeah, you, know, you would like to ask the speakers that we have here today. I mean, do you ask? Uh, can can we do it live? <clears throat> Yes, you can do it live. Okay, I have a question. I'm, I'm coming from the Butterfly Monitoring System in Israel. Actually, I'm the main developer and the IT manager. Now, we have a problem that uh, concerned with quality. Usually, we rely on uh, the, or the identification capacity of our observer and any other tools that can help them in line. I mean, uh, in real time is a way to to, to improve identification. So uh, in, 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 in the case, I find it kind of, kind of unbalanced situation that we rely too much on identification by others or the third party. So question, how do we uh, uh, solve the, this uh, uh, sensitive balance between the identification capacity of the user itself, the observer, and those other tools from third party 
that uh, that are being used in this situation. For, for example, if you don't have butterfly identification capacity by a third, third party, we need to rely on our, ours. Okay. Hi, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Frederick, I can provide some some feedback. Uh, so I think, I mean, if you if you are talking to what we, if you relate to what we presented and what we do, uh, for us, uh, we could explore uh, uh, basically what we've done with mammals for the UK. We, we could explore uh, training uh, on butterflies of a, of a certain number of groups, uh, families. We would rely there completely on the expertise uh, from your network, for example. Uh, and also it, we would have to in discussions or explore uh, what kind of data is available for training. So data that you consider as ground truth. So any of these uh, AI technologies that we're discussing that, that you hear a lot in the media, uh, a lot of the quality depends at least on two factors. One is the one that usually is mentioned, which is the amount of data needs to be sufficient. But in fact, what is also critical, perhaps even more critical is the quality of the data. And by quality, I mean, not just the um, uh, sort of uh, accuracy of the pixels and number of pixels resolution, et cetera, focus, but uh, that the identification that has been done by humans is accurate. Uh, so if you train on data, which is inaccurate, uh, wrong identification or bounding boxes, for example, uh, regions of interest which are flawed, uh, this will uh, damage uh, the AI performance. So initially the AI has basically uh, no understanding of what is in the raw data, what's called the, the initial data or raw data. Uh, so I would say it, 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 you see the potential now of what is uh, feasible. Here you have a, an example with iSpot and UK mammals at the moment. If you think this uh, type of uh, situation could help uh, your uh, contributors, observers, uh, then I, I guess the next step is to explore such technology. Uh, and again, I would, uh, it will depend uh, mainly on, on the quality of the data and the amount of data available as ground truth what you consider ground truth. I will give you an example of what I will expect AI to use. I don't know what they are using except for analyzing pictures. But for example, if you use distribution map that we use, for example, butterfly, because we know in what the, not only distribution map, but flying season. So if you use another data in the background while you are identifying, you narrow the option of uh, wrong identification by, yes. for example, this. So we use it. We have that way to do it. The question if we can, for example, provide the third party such uh, distribution map and expect them to uh, use, uh, use them for identification as, yeah, a, as so, an assistant. Yeah, so I think uh, this should obviously be used and, and should. Uh, help in the accuracy of, of what the system uh, can do. Uh, and then it's a matter of uh, working on the, the, the type of information and, and what kind of machine learning model architecture will be able to, to, to perform well. Uh, so for example, in what you mentioned, there could be uh, a notion of time involved. Uh, so then you, you need to adapt the architecture to deal with time series. Um, we've mentioned video before. So basically, depending on the, the type of data as well, uh, you will adapt uh, the architecture of the machine learning system. So this is something to, to work on, basically. Uh, work closely with uh, your team on, on the data and the uh, let's call it metadata that's available and, and test uh, which type of architecture uh, provides, can use this data to improve uh, the, the results. Thank you, Frederick, for your explanation. We have uh, just a couple of more minutes for a last question to Norbert 
on Mobius before he has to leave us today. So for the participants of the webinar, it would be your chance now. Okay. Well, I do have a short question, Norbert. Maybe because the Cost for Cloud project um, is going still summer months, it will end uh, end of February next year. Do you have already some some things that you can, yeah, so some news that uh, you can share with us on what we could expect and look forward to from Mobis' side? And we will uh, keep continue Mobis after of, uh, after the project. That's our aim. We're in close contact with uh, uh, the. EGI consortium or uh, initiative uh, for maintaining these uh, this this valuable service after project ends and uh, we in fact use it for our own citizen observatories right now so that, that there's also motivation to keep continuing this uh, we are planning to do some cool campaigns using all kinds of uh, observatories connecting the dots uh measuring water quality uh, air quality uh all in one and uh yeah we aim to have this swiss army knife of citizen science available end of uh, end of this year so uh we we, we will keep on uh, uh not only uh, uh finalizing this app but also handing over a lot of software to the citizen science community thank you very much norbert uh, yeah, it's great to hear about the, the future of Mobius because sustainability of services and everything that, that we produce in these projects is, is a big topic. Yeah, so thank you very much for, for joining. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, Norbert. And so for um, Chris or um, Frederick or also Sonia, who introduced us, introduced us to the Cost for Cloud project earlier, do you have any more questions? Because um, I'll be looking in the chat meanwhile if not we could be wrapping up the q a soon but before we do that and um, also for those that will be watching the recording of the webinar afterwards and um, stefan and clara have added um some comments um to, to points raised before and um, stefan says on the identification quality icebot has a reputation system where users get recognition for observations that have been confirmed this increases the quality of identification through community effort thank you for that and um yeah and Clem, stefan is co-developing cost for um fastcat cloud and fastcat edge together with um, frederick and their team um also, um, Clara is part of their team, and she adds that after a brief search, iNaturalist uses very large models that can identify more than 40,000 day taxa from animals to plants and more. And not sure about the accuracy. Yeah. So thank you for that. There are some more comments in the chat about iNaturalist and, and iSpot and their users. But um, if there are no more questions, uh, for the speakers so far, I'd um, like to wrap up the, the Q&A and say thank you very much to all of you for, for joining. And before we, we stop the recording and we move on to the uh, to some more minutes of um, open informal discussion, I have shared now a link to a satisfaction post event form. And if you would like to spend uh, just one, two minutes filling that out. This we would be very thankful because this allows us to, to improve your experience on future um, webinars and, and presentations of the services that we have planned for the rest of the year. Okay. So with that, Betty, I can think we stopped the recording. Yes, I'm gonna stop the recording now and we can continue with the informal discussion. <laughs>